in a world that seems to have lost focus. Join Pastor Chris Truitt on Focal Point, a ministry of Bethel Free Will Baptist Church of Kinston. Find your Focal Point in Christ starting now. Well, good morning and welcome to Bethel Worship Online. It is so good to have you with us this morning. I hope it's your prayer. I hope it's a prayer of all of us for the church that, Lord, we want to see you. We need to see you in the days in which we're living right now. Lord, we want to see your glory. We want to see your hand move in a mighty way. So let's sing this together. Let's worship the Lord. And let's give him all the praise, all right? We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire. Burn our hearts with truth. Your love is we're here. Your love is we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. Worthy of all the praise, church. Let's sing it. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face. We're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now, Lord. Unveil our eyes. Your love is with me. Your Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Church, let that be our prayer. Let's sing it. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. That's right. Come on, sing it now. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Church, like I've said before, we are in a time in our lives and in our country where we need to see the hand of the Lord moving like we've never seen it before. I think you and I agree that we need God now more than ever. So let this be our prayer, Lord. Open up the heavens. Let us see your glory. Come on, sing it, church. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. 
praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. So thank you for the grace of God in our lives. Titus 2 tells us that God's grace has appeared through salvation to all men. So thankful for the grace that the Lord gives us every single day. Amen. Come on, church. Let's worship. Let's sing this together to the Lord. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, sing it, church. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, and he has done so much, hasn't he? He sure has. Let's worship the Lord together. Come on, sing it, church. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. All of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Church. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Oh, let's sing it. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. Yeah, sing it. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Right. Come on, sing it, church. All that you've done for me. Oh, let's praise him for all he's done. Amen. Give him the praise. Well, we're glad you're joining us this morning uh, for worship. We're glad you're here uh, on, online and worshiping with us. 
I uh, got a couple of prayer requests I want to remind you about and some announcements and some things to just talk with you about. Uh, first thing is uh, tomorrow uh, on Monday and then next Monday as well, November the 2nd, I believe that will be. So two consecutive Mondays. I want to call for a time of prayer and fasting. Again, that's tomorrow, Monday the 26th. And then the following Monday, November the 2nd, I want to call for those uh, days of prayer and fasting, uh, again, for our country, our community, and our church as we're approaching these elections and then all that's going on in our, uh, our community uh, with COVID and then in our church as well as we hope to regather again soon. To that end, we hope to regather again on November the 1st. We're not sure about that, but that's our target date to regather again. And it will be uh, regathering for that, li um, for that morning service at 9.15 and then get at 10.30. We will not start back with life groups just yet. We're going to kind of ease into it, but that's our hope and our plan, but we'll be notifying you about that. We'll just keep monitoring the situation, uh, looking at our area, our community, and those in our church who are affected. Hope that you'll be praying for those who are still sick and uh, those who are suffering through this and for families uh, that are dealing with it as well. I hope that you'll be praying uh, for those. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer today, and let's ask the Lord to really be in this service. Uh, I can already feel the presence of the Lord here in this place uh, today uh, as we've sung and worshiped together and as we'll continue in just a moment to worship together and then we'll worship through the word will you bow with me right there where you are as you're bowing your head I don't know where you are right now you may be in your living room you may be driving down the road in your car I hope your head's not bowed <laughs> but you may be in your car just listening on your mobile device you may be watching in a hotel room you may be in, uh, there's no telling where you may be watching this. But right now, would you just ask the Lord to move in your heart tonight, today, and that he would uh, really speak to you as we talk about a subject in Revelation, the problem areas in our life. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, today we come to you. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting right now. Lord, pray for those who uh, are affected by this sickness. Lord, I pray that you would be with them tonight. Come for their families as well. Lord, this virus has affected the world. And Lord, I, be I really believe that it's an attack of Satan. But Lord, this does not catch you by surprise. And Lord, the Bible says that you are going to build your church and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So Lord, help us to rejoice in that fact. So Lord, we just give this service to you today. And Lord, as we pray for our service today, we pray for every place around the world where the gospel is being preached. Lord, may angels in heaven rejoice because what's preached and taught in your pulpits around the world today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to, to come together, even though it's just online, or that we can come together all across our community and even around the world to worship together. Lord, bless this service. Bless our time together. And Lord, at the end of the day, may we say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord, even if it's online as we've worshiped you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray, amen.
Father, we come to you today thankful for that blood of Jesus. Lord, that saves us, cleanses us, cleans us, and makes us recipients of your grace. Lord, it makes us the recipients of what you have in store for us one day. And Lord, not just one day, but right now as believers. Lord, as I listened and sang along with that song, I couldn't help think, but what a song. But then the Lord changed my mind. No, not a song. What a Savior. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness of our sin, as we'll talk about towards the end of this time together today. Now, Father, may your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to the prayers of this place and of your people today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be turning in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We're in a series uh, on the book of Revelation entitled The End. And we're in Revelation chapter 2. We'll be reading in verse 12 uh, in just a moment. Um, if you have not gotten your ser sermon sheets, I would encourage you, you can go right over to BethelFWB.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and uh, they are there. You can open it and download it, print it, whatever you want to do. Or uh, if you're a part of our church, uh, I believe they've been emailed out earlier this week, but I hope you will follow along in your sermon sheets. I heard a story this week, pretty comical, of a hunter. It was wintertime, and, and he was out in the forest, and he was bear hunting. With the winter quickly approaching, he was wanting uh, a new uh, warm coat made out of bear fur. So he was there hunting and watching and listening and being ever so quiet and ever so still. And in just a moment, he saw a bear approaching. He, he raised his gun slowly and quietly. And just about the time he was about to pull the trigger to shoot the bear, the bear said, wait. To the hunter's surprise, he said, what? He said, why do you want to shoot me? And the hunter replied, because I'm cold. I want a new fur coat around me for the winter. The bear replied, but I'm hungry. Maybe we could work out an agreement. An agreement they did. In the end, the hunter was enveloped in the bear's fur and the bear's stomach was full. <laughs> Not a good compromise. The point we always lose out when we try to compromise with sin. In the end, it will consume us every time. That's where we see the church in Pergamum. They had some problems. They had begun to compromise. Tonight, or today, I want to preach to you a message entitled, Problematic Pergamum. Problematic Pergamum. Revelation, if you remember, has written the whole book, the entire book was written to these seven churches in Asia Minor as a way of review. These were real churches, but as we've said the last two weeks, they were symbolic of the churches throughout the ages. Remember these churches in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. Two weeks ago, we talked about uh, Ephesus. And then we talked about suffering Smyrna last week. And today, we're going to talk about problematic Pergamum. Pergamum is modern-day Bergama. In that day, Pergamum was called the greatest city of Asia Minor. It was the capital of this Roman province of Asia Minor. It was the administrative home of the Roman governor. It was where all the business transacted. It was the center of also of cultic and idolatrous worship. 
Satan had a stronghold there. The city was the home of a temple dedicated to Caesar. And the temple was dedicated to Esculapius. An idolatrous city. So let's begin this morning looking at problematic Pergamum. Look with me in your copy of God's Word. I hope you will look at your Bible. Even if you're sitting there in your home, on the couch, or in your comfortable recliner, or wherever you are. And read with us in Revelation chapter 2. Let's begin reading now in verse 12. Notice verse 12 starts out the same way that each one of these letters to these churches begins. To the angel of the church at Pergamum write. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says, I know that where you live, where Satan's throne is, and you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the sons of Israel to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you have also those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. Otherwise, I'll come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, Father, would you bless the reading of your word, and may the word of God not go out void today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First point this morning is Christ reminds them of his power and authority. We see that in the very uh, first verse here. Obviously the first phrase to the angel of the church. And then he says, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. We're reminded of this. Christ displays himself as a judicial judge. Even further, as an executionist. We heard that same word mentioned in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. Now, he's talking about this two-edged sword. What is he talking about there? It's the word of God. The Word of God is the device of judgment. You and I will be judged in our lives based upon the Word of God one day. That will be the device of judgment. It contains the authority. It contains the power. And most importantly, it contains the truth, the Word of God. Revelation 19 and 15 says this, A sharp sword came from his mouth. So that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. Listen, he is not being introduced here as a kind, loving, gentle God. He is that at moments. But here in Revelation, and you'll see this as a characteristic of Revelation throughout the entire book. He is introduced as a mighty judge and a warrior. Let me tell you this, when he comes back one day, he will come back as a mighty warrior. This shows God's power and authority. And again, let me remind you, we'll see this throughout the entire book of Revelation. Christ reminds them of his power and authority. Second point this morning, Christ reveals their heart an action. First of all, he reminds them who he is. And now he's going to remind them about some things that they have done in their life. I told you earlier in the title of the sermon, problematic pernium. They've got some issues. They've got some problems they're going to have to deal with. First thing that our Lord does, he cheers their faithfulness. If you look back at verse 13, look there with me. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. 
And you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan lives. He was encouraging them. He, he cheers them on in their faithfulness. You have been faithful. You have endured some incredibly difficult times. You've endured persecution. You've endured suffering. So I encourage you, even in the midst of all these evil things and evilness in that city surrounding you, you you have been standing strong. And despite that intense persecution and suffering, this church had been standing strong. They refused to drop incense on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord. They rejected that. So in days past, they had been strong, but now they're beginning to cave in. A little bit and he chastises their failures sure he cheered on their faithfulness now he's going to chastise their failures look with me in verse 14 but I have a few things against you boy that's gonna hurt you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the sons of Israel to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So he's kind of chastising them for their failures. Satan was quietly beginning to deceive them. There was a group evidently among them of compromising people who had began to fill the church with their idolatry and their false teaching. Listen, I tell our people at our church all the time, everything I preach, you look at it according to the word of God. Because I never want to be untruthful to the word of God. I want to be right in line with the word of God. But they were accepting some idolatry and false teaching. Notice there, it says Satan's throne. It's, it's kind of like Satan has set up shop there. Well, that's exactly what he's done. Satan's throne refers to Pergamum's pagan worship of either Caesar or of the Greek gods of Zeus or of Acropolis, or maybe all three. We don't know exactly, but idolatrous worship was being, uh, was being brought to them and now infiltrating the church. There was a great satanic influence in their town. At this time, Satan had set up his throne in their city. Now, I need to remind you something. Satan is not omnipresent. That means Satan cannot be everywhere at one time as God is. God is everywhere at one time. Right now, he's in this place. He's in this church. He's with me. But he is also right there with you where you are. He is in other countries where our missionaries are preaching and teaching today. God is omnipresent. But you need to know Satan is not now, Satan has many demons and, and angels that are helping him and evil spirits. And Satan, Satan can move quickly from one place to another. But at this moment, he is camped out in Pergamon. He's made it his home. He's made it central command. You know what Pergamon ends up being right now? It's an evil city in these days when John is teaching this. An evil city. Earlier, they had been faithful and stood fast in the middle of intense pagan worship in their city. But now, they're compromising. Hey, let me tell you. This is happening in churches around the world right now. Churches are compromising. And listen, I am not talking about whether uh, you have pews or whether you have seats, whether you wear a tie or whether you don't wear a tie, whether you do things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doctrinal compromising. And I'm talking about the world infiltering into the church and us beginning to let up on some of the things that have been taught from the scriptures, things that God calls sin are starting to be softened on. Or to be made politically 
correct. Listen, I really don't care about politically correct. I want to be biblically correct. And so it's infiltrating our churches today. And let me tell you, Satan is lulling the church to sleep spiritually. The church is becoming more like the world every single day. And we've got to be conscious of that and aware of that. And I'm talking about doctrinal things. I'm, th I'm talking about things that are clear in Scripture. But what was invading their church? Well, it says they were indulging in immoral lifestyles. Wow. They were, they were uh, compromising and accepting the doctrines of Balaam, it says. Let me tell you about Balaam. Balaam was an Old Testament prophet who used his gifts and abilities to earn money from Balak, who was a king of Moab. And he was a corrupt, immoral, evil leader and teacher. And so Balaam was able to have then a strong influence and impact on the men of Israel. And then he invited them in to worship and feasts of the pagan gods. They began to compromise. Now, John is saying that the same thing is happening in Pergamum. Christians were forbidden to eat the meat that had been offered to idols. Paul addresses that carefully in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Then the children of Israel, referring back to them as this passage does, the children of Israel joined in these pagan practices, which also included immoral acts of fornication. If you go back to Numbers chapter 25, if you read verses 1 through 9 in that chapter, you will see that God on the spot killed 24,000 people because of this act of disobedience. And John is saying to this church, you're doing the same thing. You're accepting these, this idolatrous worship and you're accepting these immoral lifestyles. They're accepting the things of wrong. What happened? They compromised and they believed that Satan, they believed in Satan's deceit and they were deceived and they believed that it was okay to be friendly with Rome. And in those days, Rome was pagan and ungodly. What's Rome today? Rome is the world. That's what it represents today. The world's living. What the world's doing, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but it's, it's easy to let that overcome us and want to be like the world because the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But James 4, 4 quickly addresses that, and he addresses it very sternly. He says this, adulteresses, exclamation point. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. You can't be friends with God and friends with the world. I love this quote from the great preacher Charles Spurgeon. Listen carefully. If you profess to be a Christian... Yet find full satisfaction in the worldly pleasures and pursuits. Your profession is probably false. What does that mean, Chris? It means this. If you love the world more than you love God, your salvation was probably not a real experience. You may not be a Christian. You need to really examine who you are and what's inside. It would be like this. And in our Eastern North Carolina culture, this, this, I think this will help you understand this. Those of us who live in Eastern North Carolina, and that's probably predominantly who's watching today. There may be some outside uh, of, of North Carolina and outside of the country even. But in Eastern North Carolina, everyone knows... Duke and Carolina. It's a major rivalry here. It would be like a Carolina fan professing to be a Carolina fan and enjoying going to a Duke game 
more than he enjoys going to a Carolina game. If you enjoy going to the Duke game more than you do the Carolina game, I'd have to say you're probably not really a Carolina fan. You're more of a Duke fan. Hey, that's an easy little illustration to help you learn. If you love what the world is giving more than what God is giving, I would ask you to reevaluate and take a deep, deep, hard, long look down inside and see who you are. So there was this uh, indulging in immoral lifestyles. And they were accepting false teaching, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It says they began to compromise. They had regressed back into some of their pagan habits. The Nicolaitans began to spread influence. Remember the discussion about the Nicolaitans in, uh, when we were talking about the church at Ephesus? Same, same group. They decided that it was okay to put a, just a few, just a few, not many, but just a few incense on the altar and affirm their allegiance to Caesar. Hey, let me tell you what. If you're going to put a few incense on the altar to Caesar, you might as well put them all. Because what you've done then, you've rebelled against God. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? You're putting these incense on the altar of Caesar? Hey, and we do it every day. Wanting to appeal to this world. In verse 13, Antipas refused. He stood strong as a part of the church of Pergamum. He stood strong and didn't compromise his belief. What happened? He was martyred. I like this quote from C.S. Lewis. It says, indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft, underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. One of my favorite preachers and teachers, Dr. Charles Stanley, who is now retiring, great church in First Baptist Atlanta, said this, one of Satan's most deceptive and powerful ways of defeating us is to get us to believe a lie. And the biggest lie is that there is no consequences to our own doing. Satan will give you whatever you ask for if it will lead you where he ultimately wants you to be. This is so characteristic of today's culture, and of today's church. You know why? There's a name for it now. It's called moral relativism. That's what we're experiencing in our culture, in our society right now. It's the idea that there is no universal or absolute set moral principles. That morals don't mean anything. It advocates each to his own. If it feels good, do it. Anything goes because life is ultimately without meaning. We're seeing it and we have seen it now for many years in politicians. You know what? Morals seem to mean nothing anymore. We're seeing it throughout the world. This moral relativism. If that is not our culture, I don't know what is. This is I, I mentally, is subtly easing its way now into the church. You know, one reason that it's easing into the church is because Christ's way is not popular. Christ's way is not popular. Let me, let me prove that to you with a couple of, of thoughts here. Let me come and talk to you. Christ's way points to sacrifice. The world's way points to entitlement. Christ's way points to being submissive. The world's philosophy is defiance, disobedience, and rebellion. Christ's way points to suffering. The world's way points to pleasure. Christ's way points to a delayed reward one day. The current culture points to immediate gratification. We want it and we want it right now. Christ's way is Christ-centered. Today's society and culture is self-centered. This describes 
where this church at Pergamum was. And it also describes our culture, our society today. But you know what? I am so glad this letter doesn't end here. Let's go on. So Christ reminds them of his power. Christ reveals their heart and actions. Then Christ requires repentance. Look at verse 16. Therefore, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly. That's the second time that word is used in Revelation already. We'll see it again in chapter 3 and several more times throughout the book of Revelation. I'll come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He tells them two simple words. Repent. Antipas felt the sword of Rome. Remember I told you he was martyred for taking a stand. Antipas felt the sword of Rome. But let me tell you what. One day, if you don't confess of your sins, the sword of Christ will be far worse. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged or two-edged sword. Penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of of the heart. Christ said, you must repent. I've given this illustration dozens of times. Repent means to turn a 180. I'm going this way and now I turn and go this way. That's what repent means. He's saying to turn from your sin and turn to me. Turn to me. Or he gives repent or there will be repercussions. Repentance and repercussions. An immediate judge. I will come quickly. Then there's the impending consequences. Fight against them with the sword of the mouth. Let me tell you. Some consequences for our sin come now. Sometimes when we sin, there's immediate consequences. But if those sins go unconfessed, the worst consequences will come at the judgment. Let me tell you, friend, if you've never confessed your sins to God Almighty, judgment day will come. It's going to come. And you're going to take that risk. Because once Christ breaks that eastern sky and comes down, at that moment it's too Late. He says, repent or there'll be repercussions. But then finally, Christ not only requires repentance, Christ responds with forgiveness. Verse 17 in this closing verse, he closes similarly as he does to all the other letters. In this way, anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the familiar part. Then he goes on a little bit different path here to close this letter to Pergamum. He says, I will give the victor some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. First of all, he tells them, tells them in that familiar part, listen and obey. If you have an ear, listen and obey what the Spirit says. So that's the first thing. Listen and obey. Then he says, God has promised manna for those who repent. Manna would replace the meats offered to idols. It was a reminder of God's sufficiency. Remember the, the children of Israel when God provided manna for them? And they could only get so much just for that day. God's provision is promised again. When we obey, God is faithful. He meets our needs and he responds. He supplies manna for those who will endure. Has he provided your needs? I didn't say your wants. I said your needs. God's telling them right here. If you'll do what I'm telling you. If you will repent of your sin. I will provide manna for you. I will provide for your needs. Then he says I will give manna. And then he says I'll give a white stone. Now many of you are probably sitting there. What in the world does a white stone mean? Or represent? Well let me explain it to you. When an athletic 
When an athlete won an event at the Greek athletic games, many times he was given a white stone as a part of his prize. The white stone was an admission pass to the winner's celebration afterwards. This was a foreshadowing of the overcomer who will receive his ticket to eternal victory celebration in heaven, as one pastor said. That's what the comparison is here. Some think it is a symbol of Christ's purity, a white stone. In the courts of law, it was also used. When a man was on trial and being tried for a crime, at the conclusion of that trial, when the verdict was given, innocent or guilty, if he was proclaimed innocent, he was given a white stone. If he was proclaimed guilty, he was given a black stone. Both the manna and the white stone suggest two different types of eternal blessings and rewards for those who repent and turn. Here's the main thing that you need to know today. God's grace provides mercy and forgiveness and the blessing of all those, or to all those who will simply repent and turn. Pergamum, you got some problems. You've let some things invade your church. But if you'll turn back, I'll clean this up for you. And I'll give you the white stone of my blessing. In 1985, at LAX, Los Angeles International Airport, there was a suitcase, a large suitcase that was unmarked and unclaimed. And they began to be real suspicious of this suitcase. Now, back in 1985, they, that can't hold a candle to, to the suspicion that would be today. Boy, if there's an unclaimed and odd looking suitcase, boy, uh, agents would be all over that. But back in 85, it was a little bit different back then. But the U.S. Customs agent began to look at the suitcase. It was very heavy. And they, they found, as they opened up that suitcase, they found the body of an unidentified lady curled up in that suitcase. And she was dead. The coroners, after their study, Decided she had been dead for several days. They, they began to do an investigation and they found out that this lady tried to smuggle herself into the United States. Her husband, an Iranian, was living in the U.S. and she could not obtain a visa to get into the U.S. So she decided to take this into her own hands and smuggle herself by cramming herself into a suitcase. The agents were quite baffled. They really couldn't understand how a, a woman would do this because even if she had made it all the way alive, when they found out, she'd still be an illegal alien. And she would be sent back, listen to me carefully, in the same way some people believe that they will enter the kingdom of God on their own since they think they've been reasonably be, reasonably good person, a good citizen, they pay their taxes, they walk little old ladies across the street, and maybe even, hey, I attend church. Let me tell you, friend, none of those things, none of them will get you into heaven. Here's the conclusion. The entry plans of our own prove not only to be foolish, but are futile. 
You may say, Pastor, this is kind of a, a, a narrow statement, but I can't help it. It's the only way it is. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. You say, that's, that, that's just too narrow. There's got, there's got to be other ways. There's not. There's not. There's just like there's not other ways to breathe oxygen. There's only one way to breathe for me to take in a breath and let it out. We say, I don't like that mode of living. Well, then you've got no other option. There's no option of heaven except through repentance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you bow your heads right where you are? The conclusion here is the church at Pergamum is the church today. The church has become worldly. And churches who have departed from the true faith and embraced the world, they're all around us. But I'm so thankful that God's grace, even though he's pointed out to Pergamum, you've got some problems. But if you'll repent and turn them over to me, I'll take care of them. Would you do that today? Would you repent and turn it over to God and let God forgive you of your sins right there where you are? Would you pray this prayer? Father, I know that I am a sinner. Right now, I ask you to forgive, to forgive me of my sins. And I submit my life to you. I give my life to you. I put you in charge. I surrender. Would you forgive me of my sin? If you prayed that prayer, would you just put it right there in the comments, Pastor? I prayed the prayer. And then go to our website and email us or, or get our phone number. Call us. One of our pastors would love to talk to you about the decision you made. Hey, if you're a Christian right now, and you're like one of these Christians from Pergamum. You, you used to stand strong. You used to be faithful. You were one of those God was commending. But now you're one he's having to chastise. You've fallen away. You've backslidden. You're not near as close to God as you once were. But God's calling you back today. And his mercy and his grace is sufficient. He wants to bring you back. If you'll just repent. And come back. If you're a Christian, you know how to do that. The same way I just prayed with the unbelievers. But it won't be your first time. It won't be a salvation. It's just a recommitment for you. If you did that today, you can put it in the comment boxes or send us an email at the church. Either way, we'd love to know about your decision. Let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, thank you for your lesson about this church at Pergamum. Lord, a church that had some problems, and I don't know a church in the world that doesn't have some problems. Lord, they had been faithful, but then they had compromised. Lord, help our church, Bethel Church, not to be that church. Lord, I pray for all the churches in our community and around the world that we would not compromise, that we be true to the gospel and true to the faith and true to our Savior. Lord, may you bless this time together. Lord, I pray that decisions were made today that would affect people's lives for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in today and watching on this live stream. You've honored us by watching. If we can help you in any way, please contact us. Go to our website, BethelFWB.com. Or put some comment there in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. Seek us out. One of our pastoral staff would love to help you in any way that we can. Hey, we love you. We're hoping again to be back next week, November 1st. But again, we're unsure of that yet. We'll be sending out notices to let you know. But until then, hey, be faithful. Live for God. Go do something for someone else and live 
intentionally. May God bless you. Have a great day.